Minnesota. Welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. I'm your host, Tony Hernandez. Today is Saturday, June 8th. We are broadcasting live from White Bear Lake, Minnesota, from the SCC Television Studios. We got a great show today. Uh, we're going to be bringing on pretty soon Representative Mary Franson. Uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to get into a quick story because uh, we love Matt Burke at this show. Uh, he's a St. Paul hometown hero, went to Nativity grade school. He also went to Creighton Durham High School, excelled in football, uh, went to Harvard, went on to the NFL, recently won his first uh, NFL uh, Super Bowl ever. And uh, he made news because, as you know, anytime that an American team wins a major championship, whether it's the Super Bowl, the World Series, or the NCAA tournament, uh, the president of the United States usually invites the team uh, to the White House to you know, celebrate the victory and to recognize the champions. And uh, President Obama did invite the Baltimore Ravens who won this year's Super Bowl. And uh, Matt Burke uh, made news because uh, he was the only one on his team. And if Dallas could pull up this, uh, this picture here, he was the only one uh, on his team that didn't go to the White House uh, in order to uh, celebrate it. And he was recently asked uh, on the radio uh, why it is exactly uh, that he didn't go. And uh, I'm going to quote uh, Matt Burke right here. Uh, Matt Burke was quoted on the radio as saying, I have great respect for the office of the presidency, but about five or six weeks ago, our president made a comment in a speech and he said, God bless Planned Parenthood. Matt went on to say that Planned Parenthood performs about 330,000 abortions a year. Matt said, I am Catholic, I am active in the pro-life movement, and I just felt like I couldn't deal with that. I couldn't endorse that in any way. He said, I'm very confused by the president's statements. For God to bless a place where they're ending 330,000 lives a year, I just chose not to attend. Uh, that, to me, is the epitome of, of courage and really standing uh, for your convictions. And you don't see that uh, too much anymore these days. So. I just wanted to give a, a shout of recognition to a six-time All-Pro uh, center, Matt Burke. He was a former Viking, Minnesota hero. Uh, we salute you at this show. So now I'm going to bring on our, our first guest, uh, Representative Mary Franson. Welcome to the Tony Hernandez Show. Thanks, Tony. I love the name of the show. <laughs> well, thanks for, uh, thanks for being here. And if you could just uh, tell the audience a little more about uh, you know, how long you've been in the Minnesota State uh, House of Representatives and when you were elected and everything? Absolutely. Um, I am Mary Franson and I'm a mother of three children, uh, Helena, Carl, and Colin, and I represent uh, District 8B, which um, encompasses a lot of Alexandria, the city of Alexandria, and then I go up into uh, the uh, half of Ottertail County. So, yeah, it's a good time. I'm uh, currently serving my second term. Well, I want to I ask you first and foremost, because in, in 2012, you made Minnesota state news, your particular uh, election and race, because at the end of the day, uh, you ended up winning by uh, one single vote. Which one vote. And I think it was Jake. Didn't you send me that text message? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> I get this text message that says, congratulations, you won by one vote. Yep. And I'm telling you, I was not very happy. <laughs> I freaked out, you know. I turned on, I was trying to get to my laptop. I had already shut everything down because I was already ahead. So I just, you know, I was just going to go we to sleep. Were, we were happy. You won. I so know. that's all we cared about. <laughs> I was, I, I feel, I'm very glad that I won also. Yeah. But, you know, it was a great story. And I'm actually very glad that I um, this time went around yeah. just by one vote. It was really great. Well, that's, that's uh, pretty amazing. And there was a, a recount there. Can you just talk about, were you, were you nervous at all that they were going to find some vote in the, in the cracks or crevices the, to overturn your victory? Well, I think ever since the Norm Coleman race, uh, people think that mm -hmm. uh, obviously some ballots were going to be found in some, I mean, that was a joke around, around the state that, that ballots were going to show up in trunks. And, um, but yeah, no, after, after the first day of kind of like, why did I only win by one, I actually just... Um, I just turned to prayer, and uh, every day somebody new told me how they went to vote mm -hmm. for me and um, gave me that one vote. And um, so this election for me is more meaningful because I got to know individual stories of how people. One guy walked three and a half miles to the um, poll so that he could go cast his vote for mm -hmm. me. And that is, uh, I mean, these are just real stories, real people. And yeah, it, it made me more in tune to the district and get to know people even more. 
That's uh, that's that's pretty amazing. And uh, you know, the other thing that I, I wanted to touch on, uh, you know, you mentioned your family, and uh, what I'm really interested in is, you know, there's there's not so many uh, women, strong women, conservative voices in the Minnesota legislature right now. And I wanted to ask you about: Are there any unique uh, pressures or situations that you you face as a mother and a legislator? And, and how do you balance, you know, time with your your kids who are here right now and yeah, and doing studio, your important yeah. work uh, at the Capitol? Um, it, mine is a unique situation because I'm um, a rural legislator, and so since I I live more than 50 miles away, mm -hmm. I I stay down in St. Paul during the week, um, and I'm also a single mom which uh, is very different because I, I am the only single mom in, that represents um, in, in the Republican side of the caucus. So yeah, it's, it's a different balancing act, but I think I can also bring a different perspective uh, for, for single moms out there that are, are raising their children. Um, and because the Democrats have offered policies that really do not help uh, women achieve their American dream and help help uh, their children achieve their mm -hmm. American dream also. And so um, I think that that's a different, unique perspective to bring. But yeah, no, we, I have great relationships. The, their dad helps out immensely, grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so it's really a team effort that I'm able to um, serve the people of my district. W one of our first shows actually here, we had a woman, her name's Julia Sonnen, and she started a, a private not-for-profit called Families Helping Each Other. And her, her specific focus is helping single moms uh, single parents. So she talked a lot about the, the struggles that single mothers face here. Uh, did you ever experience any, any backlash from, from voters or when you're door knocking or people asking, you know, what are you doing as a mother? You know, you have kids that you should be taking care of and you don't, do, do you ever get any of that? You know, or? and that's different because men do not get that at the door. They don't, well, who's going to take care of your children mm -hmm. while you're down in St. Paul? And yeah, there are voters that have asked me that. And you know, like I say, I say, you know what, I am fighting for my children's future, and I believe that I can give up um, some time away from home to make sure that they have opportunities for the future, and also that their friends can have opportunities also. And so if this is, this is my way to do that, and my children will end up thanking me down the road mm -hmm. for, for serving the state. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to uh, have a, a, a discussion about child daycare unionization and that particular bill uh, that passed, but before we get too much into those details. I just wanted to hear a little more about your thoughts of this last session. Uh, were there any successes? What were the failures? And it, you know, there was a number of different proposals on the table. And you know, I was at the Mall of America last night and uh, did some shopping there. And I didn't, I didn't actually know did, did the Democrats pass the the sales tax or not. And I was so thankful when <laughs> when I bought those clothes, the maternity yeah. clothes for my wife that we didn't get taxed on that extra uh, percentage. But can you talk a little more about the the session and and what you experienced? Well, the session was extremely disappointing for mm -hmm. all freedom-loving um, Minnesotans out there. Uh, anytime, uh, the, the Democrats are so good at, at finding ways to take money away from our wallets, take money away from our budgets to further fund the bloated government that we have. And uh, it, frustrating as it is to be in the minority, it's even more frustrating to tell your constituents, and my constituents know where I stand on issues. Mm -hmm. So basically, I'm, my inbox is, is, I don't get a lot of emails, I don't get a lot of phone calls because people know where I stand. But business owners would, would call me and email me and say, please do everything mm -hmm. you can. We, you know, this, this tax is going to hurt us this way. Uh, this minimum wage is going to hurt us this way. And I'm like, you know, you know where I stand. They're like, I know it's not you, but what can you do? And I'm like, you need to talk to those DFLers. Mm -hmm. those, those greater Minnesota DFLers are in the same boat, um, represent businesses also that need to understand that we, um, we are com coming out of a recession and Minnesota's economy is, is doing very well. Um, but to put on more burdens on our business and to punish success, is just plain wrong, and that's basically what the Democrats have done. Um, you know, and, and I, they, they subsidize. You know, basically the policies that they put into place this last budget. Now, um, you know, the state literally is going to burn up. It's going to go up in flames because we just we're just not mm -hmm. going to be able to do it. So since we're subsidizing a lot of stuff, I mean, the least the Democrats could have done is subsidize some hot dogs and marshmallows, so <laughs> we could at least enjoy the bonfire, right? <laughs> <I like So>. I, it, it's a very exasperating. And then, and then we talk about, they, they said that they were just going to raise taxes on the rich, but underneath the tax plan they passed, everybody is rich. Mm -hmm. From smokers, 
Mm -hmm. to our corporate um, executives. I mean, there is nobody that's going to escape the wrath of the DFL tax plan. Yeah, I did the math. Uh, the House Democrat plan actually would have taxed a woman, a single woman, making $33,000 a year. It would have taxed her a 3% increase. That was, wow, I thought it was only the rich, right? I don't right. think many people would say a single lady making 33000 a year would be a rich woman, so. No, and, and we, want, we want women to be successful. We, right. want, we want uh, our single moms to be successful. And uh, the tax plan they're putting into place actually br um, brings burdens and, mm. and, and hurts women uh, who are trying to get out of poverty, who are trying to climb, climb up the ladder of success. And right. uh, what the Democrats promise on the campaign trail certainly is not what they deliver once they're right. on the House floor. Absolutely. And uh, the public needs to see them for who they are. I mean, they're frauds. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk, Governor Dayton made some news, and I, I read it in the when newspaper news, and right? uh, quite often, I think. And there's a surplus right now with the, the Minnesota state budget. At least that's my understanding is that there's actually a surplus, meaning in the state of Minnesota is taking in more in revenues than, than is yep. actually spending out. And I think in large part, we could credit that to the past legislator of 2010 Absolutely. for some of the policies that were put into place then. Uh, so given the surplus, I, I read somewhere that Governor Dayton said that if we continue to have these surpluses, he, he actually can see us lowering taxes for Minnesota working families, for business owners and, and entrepreneurs. Uh, can you explain a little more about, about this? Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Another fraud. <laughs> I mean, seriously, you can't make this stuff up. No. Like, we're going to tax the bejeebers out of you, and then if things keep on going um, the way they are, thanks to the Republicans, the tax plan they put in two years ago, if things keep going the way they are, then I'm going to do some tax cuts. Well, gee whiz, Governor <laughs> Dane, gee, thanks a lot. Um, no, it's it's absolutely ridiculous. He's up for re-election, so now he's going to want right. to see. He's going to want to be a little bit more moderate in his approach. Well, I'm not going to let the public uh, forget exactly the kind of man that Governor Dayton is. I mean, he has he has uh, come up with craziest ways. I mean, can you imagine taxing haircuts? Right. Okay, he wants to tax haircuts. If he had his way, he would. Thank goodness some of that stuff was rolled back, but. 2.1 billion dollars mm -hmm. worth of new yeah. taxes and then the audacity which really drives me up a wall they're raising 2.1 billion dollars in taxes and then they cut health and human services right. and in our nursing homes are are barely getting a cost of living increase and it's all like fake money it's mm -hmm. they have to take it out of their their own budget in the nursing home to in order to uh, give their workers a pay raise and my nursing home administrators uh, see this uh, smoke mm -hmm. and mirrors for yeah. what it is too I mean People are, uh, people are certainly engaged. Right. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, we're going to uh, play some uh, testimony here. This was during the child care unionization debate that was going on. And there was a number of uh, people, uh, business owners, daycare providers, that, that stood up and, and testified. So I think that's a pretty good segue to uh, talking to what we're going to talk about next. So if we could pull that up and uh, play it now. My name is Julie Seidel. I have been a self-employed business owner as a licensed child care provider for over 10 years now. The first thing that I would like to say is that we need to remember this is not just about unionization and CCAP reimbursements. This is about the children in our care and that has been forgotten. I adamantly oppose Bill HF 950. I am self-employed. I am not a state employee. If I wanted to be somebody's employee, I would still be working at an Oak County that I left over 10 years ago. I have chosen this profession because this is what I want to do. I take care of children, I give them love, nurturing, and education, and I do not need the assistance from a union to do this. Um, as an anesthetist and an administrator in the healthcare facility, I have my healthcare masters and I have my business masters. So I've asked myself, what value would a union bring to an organization such as this? A value-added proposition that I just cannot see. Uh, when you look at over 99.99% of the daycare providers do not want to be unionized. They are providing this type of service without the help of a union. I was struck by the comments that came across by the group. They talked about the wonderful care they gave. I still add, what is a union going to bring to them? So the union is not a necessary unity for us in order to have rules and regulations set. We already have organizations that lobby for us. <laughs> uh, licensed family child care providers have fought against child care unionization for the past eight years, especially in the past two. And we've overwhelmingly proved that we are against this. 
I don't understand why our legislators and the unions are not listening to us. I do not want to be an employee of the state. I did not apply for a government job. I chose to be a small business owner with an 11 hour work day. Plus related responsibilities that require me and my family to make additional sacrifices. I love what I do and I know that I make a positive difference in the lives of young children and their families. Manly families are looking specifically for faith-based family child care. As an employee of the state, I do not see my right to continue offering a faith-based family child care being protected. There's no support for this amongst the licensed family child care profession. This is why unlicensed caregivers have been included in the process. The union cannot win a vote without them. You guys are taking away my freedom, giving it to the power of organization. You have an awesome responsibility to decide which is it. Do, is the power to organize stronger than my ability to freely associate, freely have business, and to choose who I'm going to have a business contract with? I'm a licensed family child pro provider in Rosemont. Along with my husband, I've built and operate a thriving child care business in our home for the past nine years, providing care to 11 families, and I currently have three employees. I'm just going to make one point. I manage my child care to be a quality, quality program. And upon meeting me and my program, a family can choose to have their child come to me or choose to go somewhere else. The way the union is doing business right now is forcing themselves into our home, running to the government to support their industry. If the union had representation right now that I felt would be an asset to my business, I could join. We currently have that option because as of, to, as of today, I still have that choice. Um, I'm Vicki Reese. I'm a provider in St. Paul for 20 years, and I oppose the organization of a union for the simple fact is they're only providing us one thing so far. We've asked and asked and asked, what can you do for us? Um, I applaud the fact that they're doing quality care. We all are. We are all teaching our children. We're all sending our kids to school educated with their alphabet and writing and spelling. But it doesn't take a union to make that happen. It makes quality, qualified people, mothers, fathers, um, providers, um, community. It takes everybody. And I've been doing... So that's uh, some of the testimony that was at the Minnesota State Capitol in opposition to child care unionization. And, you know, for me, I just don't really quite understand, like, the, the logic behind it because we have, these are business owners. These women are entrepreneurs. They started a business, most, most likely out of their home. I get why they need to have a license through the state, and they should be regulated to a certain degree. Uh, but I don't understand how... Is this an unprecedented move? Is this the first time ever that a government has actually tried to unionize business owners, Mary? This is a nationwide effort by AFSCME and SCIU mm -hmm. to unionize child care providers. Um, and so there's other states that are mm -hmm. fighting this also. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's come to Minnesota. It's now in law that to begin the unionization process of thousands of small business owners. These are, these are primarily women who own their own business, that uh, empower themselves, I mean, strong, independent women, they certainly do not need a union to come in and save them. And as a matter of fact, I mean, it's pretty offensive to think that, uh, you know, we've fought for so long um, women's rights and women, uh, you know, empowering women to be able to work outside the home and to own their own businesses. And, and now um, to say that they can't do this themselves without a union is kind of a slap in the face. And, um, yeah, it's it's very sad. And I've been I was a child care provider, so I know the business. And mm -hmm. a, certainly, a, a union is not going to offer any benefit. The only benefit the union is going to get is by garnishing, garnishing money that was meant for poor families uh, to help them uh, uh, cover the cost of child care, uh, to allow families to get into the workplace, get them to school so that they can um, achieve their American dream. And now. Uh, this is just going to hurt. It's going to hurt families. It's going to lower quality of care. It's going to um, obviously raise costs and also um, uh, it's just going to also um, reduce uh, in greater Minnesota especially it's going to reduce access to care. Mm -hmm. So did you uh, hear from anybody that is in favor of this or did you hear from daycare providers that are in favor for this or, or can you give us at least the other the flip side yeah. of the coin why, why do people want this? The, there are people that want this there's a handful a handful um, the union is in place now I mean if you want to mm -hmm. join the union you can 
willingly sign a card that says you want to be a union member and you can pay union dues to ask me. Um, 57 providers out of 11,000 licensed child care providers, 57 have done that. That was as of December, 57 have willingly done that. That tells me, Tony, uh, that's a failed pilot program. Mm -hmm. So why is the government pushing this agenda? And also what was just fascinating from my, I have a psychology degree, so this whole process me was too. just, <laughs> this whole process is just, uh, it was um, very eye-opening for me and just on, a, just on a psychological plane here. We had, we had these women telling their legislators, we do not mm -hmm. want this, vote no. We're talking independents, Republicans, and Democrats. I mean, Democrat women were holding up signs saying, I'm a DFLer, vote no on this bad bill, right? And they basically treated these women like, they didn't even know what they were talking mm -hmm. about, that they were misled on this bill, uh, that Republicans were lying to them. And that really infuriated them because obviously they've read the bill. They've been fighting this for eight years now. Mm -hmm. uh, and for the their uh, DFL rep to say, oh, well, you're wrong and we believe in collective bargaining has really, really angered them that they were not heard. I have a stack of emails like this at home, this this thick with people saying, do not vote on this bill from all over the state of Minnesota. Now, in my district, I do have two um, who are pro-union, but um, the rest of the, the providers just, they do not want it and they're very upset. And then when you think about the poor families, that um, this money is meant for and for the unions to garnish that, to just to put it into their own political coffers is very disgusting. Right. You mentioned this was a, a, a national movement. Mm -hmm. Are there any other states that have passed this in the legislation? Yes. Um, currently, uh, well, there was 15 states that have had a union and now only seven have active contracts. Rhode Island and Connecticut, I believe Connecticut, definitely Rhode Island, are, are uh, the newest targets for AFSCME. And I've been in contact with legislators in both of those states because mm -hmm. I, I believe that we actually we really need to educate each and every state out there that this is going on. In California, uh, it w made it to the uber liberal uh, Governor Brown, Brown yeah, right? Brown, yeah. Right. Um, and he vetoed that bill because there was no money. I mean, the, the legislature has to appropriate money uh, for these union contracts also, right? So, and then also on top of that, um, what if, if what, what point is having a legislature? What, what point is it to have a representative and a senator if you're gonna abdicate your responsibility to unions right. doing the negotiating? Yep. It's wrong. One thing I, I wanted to point out too that I found uh, uh, pretty, uh, Unbelievable, actually. I remember reading some things from State Senator Karen Housley and I think Representative Lomer, uh, but Karen in particular, uh, she was writing about how crazy it was that they were debating this on the State Senate floor at uh, the nth hour on like a Sunday, mm -hmm. on a Sunday night. And can you talk just a little more and tell the, the viewing audience a little more about the tactics that were used to pass this and, and how the House was involved and how the Senate was involved? Well, the first, when we first took up the bill, oh gosh, what was it? We did it in three different chunks in the House. Um, but uh, when the House file was brought up, we um, were going to send it, we did a motion to send that bill back to rules. Um, and a call for division was made. There was hardly any DFLers on the floor. All the Republicans were in their seat. We stood to be counted and Speaker Thiessen turned his chair like this and refused to acknowledge the Republicans. Um, and Kurt, Representative Doubt, Minority Leader Doubt, um, he was, uh, you know, a lack of sleep will do this to people, but he was, uh, he got a little, he got a little feisty on the House floor and he said, you know, Rep or, um, Speaker Thiessen, I, I can count for you. Mm -hmm. There's 61 Republicans here and you've got X many, Dem I mean, they, he waited until all his members were in their seat mm -hmm. because it was gonna, you know, fail. He refused to, that's part one of the shenanigans. Um, but yeah, we took up that bill in various different chunks. It was, I just know that those deal fallers, they did not want to pass it, but money is extremely powerful. Union is very powerful. And for people to know that this is a bad bill and then still vote is just, mm -hmm. it was just, it's unbelievable. And for suburban people to vote for this. You want to unionize moms? Really? 
that, that work out of their own home to, to better these children's lives and help take care of them while their parents are, are making a living for their children. Um, but once again, this is funds that are meant for poor people. This is your tax dollars that you, that you put toward the government in order for poor families to go into work and the union is going to steal that money. It's just absolutely wrong. And when I did childcare, I actually had families that were on those programs. Um, my first mom was a, a recovering meth addict. Mm -hmm. uh, five children, three of which were taken away, and so she was she was holding on to those two children, working at a fast food restaurant. She dropped her children off at 4:30 in the morning. I had to get up about 4, 4:15 in the morning. That was a business decision I made. I didn't have to take that family, mm -hmm. but. Um, you know, I want to make sure that all children have a great place to go, and I believe that I had a, a good quality program for her children. And and these children need to be loved also, and they need to know that there is an American dream out there. And and on top of all of this, though, I got um, so many messages from providers that childcare providers that said, "I'm a, I'm a Democrat, and for years I thought Republicans protected the rich. Here they were protecting me." a business owner mm -hmm. of one who wants to remain independent and Republicans were there for me. And so they thanked me and, and they were like, I just cannot believe my party that I've been with my entire life has just thrown me to the wolves right. and doesn't care about me. And so that has opened the eyes of all these providers and, and women, we can talk. And so um, each one of these providers has families that they are talking to and those families are gonna talk to other people. And when I go home, that's what people are talking about, not only the tax plan, but the fact that small business, independent private businesses are going to be taken over by the state. And these women, uh, these business owners made into state employees. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, the state is going to make 16 full-time employees just to handle the unionizing aspect of this whole thing. Yeah, I'm sure those funds that go to the union are going to be equally disseminated in the political process to both sides, right? Right. Yeah, because yeah, they do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you, can you talk a little more about uh, what can you do about it? I mean, is this something that's reversible or well, is this something that's going to be in the books for Minnesota future? Well, my first bill when I get back into session is going to be mm. a repeal obviously, of that terrible, terrible bill. Um, and then the providers have a couple of lawsuits going on. Uh, obviously, they, they had to fight this last year. They sued and they won because Governor Dayton was found to be illegal in his attempt to unionize via executive, executive order. order. Yeah. yeah, and so he lost. And so now um, they've done these lawsuits. So I'm not sure when those will be taken up, but hopefully soon. But now Governor Dayton has called these business owners childish for protecting their business. He called he called them childs or ch uh, childish and I just think that is absolute name calling mm -hmm. from the governor is so wrong. I mean it's so immature. I mean he's he's the governor of the, of Minnesota and he's calling these business owners childish. It's just it's ridiculous. Mm. Well that seems to be a, a continuing uh, mentality that's growing more and more at the at the top of the Democratic Party. I'm not talking about the, you know the people on the grassroots level, but you see more and more at the top of the DNC, top of the DFL uh, really coming down on uh, the business owners or coming down on uh, people who want to be entrepreneurs and to what? live independent of government like uh, there's some type of uh, wackos or, or, or somehow out of touch with the rest of the state, but it's been my experience talking to Minnesotans that most Minnesotans want to be independent. Well, they want to achieve the American dream, and Democrat policies do not mm. allow businesses to, and, and people who want to achieve their version of the American dream, their policies do not do that. It does anything but, and it, it stifles growth, it stifles creativity, it stifles success. Um, and so these women who own their own small business, child care providers, they have their American dream. Their American dream is is their own business mm -hmm. to um, take in these children, um, run a child care out of their home. That's their American dream. Mm -hmm. And now the Democrats want to squash their American dream and, and make them into state employees. So basically they can even control this business even more than what the state already does. I mean, the state has regulations upon regulations. It's a highly regulated industry. And so... Um, the, w the providers that get into this, they certainly do not uh, do it just because. I mean, they actually they have a heart to do it and they want to be successful. And 
unfortunately, the Democrats are destroying their dream. Mm. Well, we're going to be bringing on uh, Sam Wayne Pierce here pretty soon, but I just wanted to give you the, the last floor to, to let people know uh, how they can learn more about you, about the policies. Do you have a website or a Twitter account or anything like that? I have. I'm very active on my Facebook. So if you are on Facebook, you can go to Representative Mary Franson. I think I have the most fans in the House. So I'm at 50. 1,651, so I would like to get it up to 1,600 if I can. Um, but yes, I post a lot of stuff, and you will always know exactly where I stand on the issues. So, um, But I think that's a good thing. Also, yes, I'm on Twitter, uh, Rep. Mary Franson. And then also, um, you can always email me. My, my email is rep.mary.franson at house.mn and what a pleasure it was to have yeah thank you so much show. representative mary francis for thank coming you. on and for all of you watching people and Jake, watch this on, so uh, <laughs> nice to see you <laughs> people watch this show on on facebook uh, quite a bit so if you if you are out there it's representative mary francis mm -hmm. that's the facebook fan page uh, let's help her to get some more likes -S -O -N. F -R -A -N -S -O -N. look it up on facebook like it you know tell your your friends and family as well uh thank you so much again You're for welcome. coming on and, and for bringing the kids too it they was, were uh, very well behaved so they a were. shout out to carl and colin carl <laughs> and colin and good luck with your with, with your baseball guys i hope you uh continue to play oh, they're sports, the cutest so. little things ever so well thank you and, so much for coming on and two good teams they got the cubs and the twins that's like right that. <laughs> that's <laughs> right well i wouldn't say good teams is Hey, it's record, good to them. Yeah. I mean, you know, that is their team they play for. Yeah, good so franchises. Good for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. All right. Well, we're going to bring in uh, Sam Wayne Pierce, who is broadcasting live from the uh, great state of New York. Uh, Sam Wayne Pierce, uh, can you hear us? Hi, Tony. How are you, Sam? I'm great. Hello, Minnesota. Hello, Sam. Uh, so you're not, uh, you're not at your uh, usual place right now. Where are you, uh, where are you broadcasting from? Tony, I'm doing my typical Skype interview to appear on your show today, but I'm coming at you from a different location, Lake Placid, New York, which your viewers may recall was the site of the 1980 Winter Olympics. I'm in Lake Placid to run a marathon tomorrow morning, but as I was saying, Lake Placid is more importantly remembered as the site for the Miracle on Ice. And the Miracle on Ice has become the pop culture nickname to describe the United States in the 1980 Winter Olympics uh, as the hockey team upset the heavily favored Soviet Union. Nice. So you're 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 in Lake Placid then. You're you're for uh, you're you're doing a marathon tomorrow or a half marathon or what? Running the full marathon tomorrow wow. morning, Tony. Twenty six point two miles. So wow. Wish, wish me luck. Have you been uh, training? Are you ready for this? Yeah, I ran uh, I ran nineteen two weeks ago. Felt great, and at that point, I decided I'll run I'll run the full this year, not not just the half. So, uh, so I've been training all all winter and uh, spring into the spring. And uh, hopefully get some cool weather. It, it cooled down here uh, significantly, so hopefully get some nice cool and maybe even rainy weather tomorrow. That sounds good. But yeah, I, I tweeted just earlier uh, at my Twitter account about getting a new pair of shoes last night for running, and I hadn't gotten a new pair of shoes since I, I, I trained for the marathon. So I was using these same shoes, and my knees started to hurt, my ankles started to hurt. I, I bought these new shoes and went for a run today, and it was like a it was like a whole new world, you know. It was like running, yeah. uh, basically on on all new earth, you know. Like felt like yeah. I was running on clouds, and it just reinvigorated after having those new shoes. Like I want to get out there, I want to start running again. And if it's not too late, I'm going to sign up for the Twin Cities Marathon again because uh, you know the time to do that is now, and and I need to beat that last time that I did before. I just have to. Tony, so maybe we should do it together. You want to? I you know, I need a little motivation right now. Let's do it. If we did, we could do once a week. Uh, you know, we do the long run once a week, right, Sam? Isn't that kind of the, the deal? Or you'd you'd want to do you'd want to do your long training run at least once a week. Most people that that, that are at work during the week will do it on a Saturday or Sunday, right. and then throughout the you know, and, and you build up over yeah. the course of a few months as you prepare for the marathon. You'll go from running ten to twelve to fourteen, and you know, eventually you'll top out around twenty miles a few weeks before uh, the race and then o over the course of the week obviously you get out and you run yeah. shorter distances you do some speed work that sort of thing yeah and i think that the shorter distances you know running the three to six miles you know you can do that on your own pretty easily it it's when you really start building up and going to uh you know running like 10 to 12 to 14 to 60 miles that's when you really need a partner with you because yeah. you know there's some days where you hit that 15 or 16th mile and you're just like 
you don't want to do it anymore, you know. And if you have somebody by your side running with you, you know, you can kind of talk each other through. I, I, that's what I, you know, that's what I think is very important. So, so we, we should do the show after running the marathon. That'd be a, quite an experience, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. We would. It would be a Saturday, huh? We could just hobble up and... <laughs> Yeah. Maybe we'd have to do a pre-recording that it'd day. Be, I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I think it'd be pretty funny. We'd just be like, oh, well, it's the Tony Hernandez show. Uh, hello, Minnesota. I'm a little sore today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it was a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty another big week. I tell you, the, the, you know, the, the federal government continues to give us more and more material and content uh, for for the show, mm -hmm. which is you know good and bad. It's very good. Bad. It's very bad. Well, it's good because we have something to talk about. Okay. You know, we don't have to hire these expensive writers. To, I'd to you know, Tony. Material. I'd rather talk about how much I'm enjoying the liberty I have in this country instead of talking about these scandals. And I can't even keep track of them right now. It's like that Fast and Furious scandal. Remember the one where the government actually gave weapons to Mexican drug lords and it came back and killed two federal agents. Remember that one? I do. It's like that one doesn't even exist anymore. The Benghazi attack where our president was defunking leadership, where we had uh, people calling for extra security and they didn't get it in Benghazi at uh, an embassy. And the next thing you know, uh, we have uh, our chief diplomat over there dead. I mean, that's like almost not even talked about anymore because of all these other scandals. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, there, there's a lot of validity to that, which maybe, you know, that is the brilliance of the current Chicago political machine that's in power right now is, hey, you know, we're entering this period where President Obama's starting to get heat yep. from people even within his own party. And maybe what they got to do is just overload all these various scandals out there. It makes you So it gets it you to you a wonder. point where you're yeah. just like, you're like, what should we even talk about? Like, you know, and it, and it almost puts overkill on this idea that we have an, a big, obtrusive government that's spying on us, that's uh, flying drones uh, above our, our, our own land, that's planning uh, certain things that we probably can't even talk Targeting about. Targeting individuals and groups in the IRS. And the funny thing about it is, it was a month ago on this show, we were talking about the President's Ohio State University commencement address. and. In that address, he called. Uh, he told the students, "Don't worry about all those people along the way that have been talking about government being tyrannical." And look at what we're seeing now. We've got the NSA spying on our emails, wiretapping our phone lines. We don't even have Eric Holder uh, confirming to our senators that they are not uh, listening to phone conversations of congressmen. You got the IRS targeting individuals, the IRS targeting uh, specific Tea Party and conservative groups. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Well, we're going to, uh, I'm going to try to line up a, a video here. Uh, this is President Obama. We figure, you know, President of the United States, we'll let him give the first word. Uh, he gave this press conference on, uh, what date is this? June 7th, mm -hmm. so yesterday. Uh, so this is pretty fresh, uh, uh, fresh material here. And this is in response to uh, asking, he was asking about the NSA snooping. Okay. And so this is President Obama at, in his own words. And when I came uh, into this office, uh, I made two commitments that are more important than any commitment I make. Number one, to keep the American people safe. And number two, uh, to uphold the Constitution. And that includes uh, what I consider to be uh, a constitutional right to privacy uh, and an observance of civil liberties. Now, the programs that have been discussed over the last couple of days in the press uh, are secret in the sense that they're classified, but they're not secret in the sense that uh, when it comes to telephone calls, every member of Congress has been briefed on this program. Uh, with respect to all these programs, uh, the relevant intelligence committees are fully briefed on these programs. Uh, these are programs that have been authorized by broad bipartisan majorities repeatedly since 2006. And so I think at the outset it's important to understand that uh, your duly elected representatives have been consistently informed on exactly what we're doing. Now, let, let me take uh, the, the, the two issues separately. When it comes to telephone calls, Nobody is listening to your telephone calls. That's not what this program's about. As was indicated 
uh, what uh, the intelligence community is doing is looking at phone numbers and durations of calls. They are not looking at people's names, and they're not looking at content. But by sifting through this so-called metadata, they may identify potential leads with respect to folks who might engage in terrorism. If these folks, uh, if the intelligence community then actually wants to listen to a phone call, they've got to go back to a federal judge, just like they would in a criminal investigation. All right, so that's uh, President Obama justifying the program. Uh, one area that I find very intriguing is how he reiterates over and over again that every member of Congress has been made aware of this program. And, and I actually take the president at his word on this, and I don't have the video, but I watched uh, Congressman Representative Keith Ellison yesterday. Uh, you know, he was, he was kind of feigning some of his outrage over the NSA, spying on citizens. Well. Well, Representative Ellison, here, here's the President of the United States, the head of your own party, who's saying that uh, you knew about this program long, long, long time ago. And in, and in fact, I'm not even that surprised by this. I mean, I remember back in uh, the early 2000s when I was still in college, I remember learning about the carnivore program. We learned about it. And carnivore program was a program where uh, the FBI and other investigative bodies would actually spy on your emails. If you had keywords in there, they could go in there and look. and and da 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 da. But Jake, do you think that that's significant and not what I'm, how well, every member is? is yeah, known I think about that's this? overstated because I, I believe if you, you would have to be in the House Intelligence or Senate Intelligence Committee to actually be seen that. So I would actually more be pointing towards those individuals, those congressmen, senators that are not disclosing this to the public. Um, I actually believe that many of these congressmen found out about it for the first time this week because they don't sit on that specific committee. So I, I wouldn't agree, or at least I don't believe it to be, uh, you know, 435 members of the House and 100 U.S. Senators have been aware. Mm -hmm. and, and Sam, am I off basis here, though? I mean, I'm, I'm really not surprised by this whatsoever. I'm not surprised that the government is tracing these calls or tracking these calls. I'm not surprised that they're, they're doing these different types of things. Are you? No, no Tony, not, a, not at all. And I think that uh, although the Patriot Act has been amended and, and, and debated within Congress, uh, President Obama did not, uh, <laughs> unlike the candidate, uh, Senator Obama, uh, did not try to pressure Congress into repealing the Patriot Act. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very much the law. I want to make a quick comment. Uh, as we talked about all the various scandals, and it seems like every week something new out of Washington. Every day. Uh, I thought it was interesting that this week, President Obama, as this comes out in the news, what happens but a day or two later... President Obama giving a news conference, and you just played uh, a, a portion of it, Tony. Uh, I think the president is very comfortable in the legality of what the NSA is doing, and hence we see him on TV two days later talking about it. Notice that with Benghazi or the IRS that he found out about in the news, just like you and I, it's been delay. Uh, in some cases, it, it, it looks like the White House press secretary has just lied to America. In this case, President Obama addressed us immediately, and to me that says he feels quite comfortable about the legality of, of the ongoings of the NSA. Jake? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to agree with what, what he said. I mean, I, I don't really take much of what this president says as uh, truthful. I mean, this is a guy that's overseen quite an expansive uh, federal government. Uh, he's expanded the debt. He's expanded the... Uh, Intrusion on the Fourth Amendment it's expanded on um, our actually footprint overseas as far as going into Libya and increasing the soldiers over in Afghanistan. So, yeah, he's got quite a quite a problem right now. Well, I want to uh, I want to uh, go to another testimony because this was actually uh, this was made news and I forgot the organization. We'll give them credit mm -hmm. after, uh, but they broke this story because back in March uh, there was a congressional testimony and it was Senator Ron Wyden. He's a Democratic yep. uh, U.S. Senator. He uh, questioned the director of the National Intelligence, James Clapper, in a Senate hearing in March. And, 
and Clapper has denounced revelations in the media that the phone and internet records have been collected. But this was back in Mar March, and he was asked mm -hmm. uh, point blank about this. So we'll play that right now. So what I wanted to see is if you could give me a yes or no answer to the question, does the NSA collect any type of data at all on millions or hundreds of millions of Americans? No, sir. It does not? Not wittingly. There are cases where they could in inadvertently perhaps uh, collect, but not, not wittingly. So, Jake, what do you uh, what do you think about that? That's a lie, unless well, he's aware of it, so it's just a bold faced lie. But I mean, you can't ever expect these guys to be truthful. I mean, that's the whole point in a centralized power that doesn't feel like they have to answer to the average people, or or that don't have to a answer to a, a press or a media that's actually really doing their job out there in Washington D.C. I mean, Sam, what do you think? I mean, how about that? Uh, how about that body language that that oh, he yeah. had? He's he's <laughs> like, uh, well. Uh, um, yeah, no, we're, it, we're not doing it wittingly or, or whatever the, the situation was with that. But, Sam, do, 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 you, do you believe he looks, him? Uh, well, he looks, uh, to, to Jake's comment, uh, he, he looks he looks just very annoyed to even be there. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, he, uh, and he looks almost annoyed that he has, that he has to lie. Um, so it was. It's an interesting video clip. I don't think anyone is fooled by it. I did want to make a note, Tony. You said you, you said you needed to give credit to uh, whoever had broken the story. I believe it was the Guardian yep. newspaper in United Kingdom, yep. and <laughs> the investigative journalist who broke the story. It, we we should note um, it's so. It's a it's a gentleman I believe that has been very much at the forefront of the anti anti terror movement, <laughs> um, meaning. Uh, very, I, I think, civil libertarian uh, type of persona, and uh, and that that frustrated a lot of the media here in the United States that the leak had gotten gotten to the Guardian uh, rather than out in, in in the press here. Well, I want to uh, I want to really kind of shift the focus of this discussion here because I think we may have some varying opinions, but let's be frank. Uh, you know, Benjamin Franklin said those who want to exchange their liberty for security deserve neither of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's look at modern day America. Uh, I would argue that a substantial portion of Americans, if not probably a majority of Americans, I'm talking 60 to 70 percent, definitely believe that the federal government has to do everything and anything that it possibly can uh, to keep Americans safe. Obviously, in recent times, we're not seeing uh, this correlate into the safety of Americans. There was the Boston uh, Marathon terror plot. There's been other domestic uh, terror. There was um, the uh, Hassan case at mm -hmm. Fort Hood. Uh, there was just that uh, issue or the, the story out of um, uh, in California, in Southern California, in Santa Monica, uh, shooting there. Uh, so it doesn't seem like some of these uh, big government, uh, bro big brother spying programs are necessarily working. But Sam, do, do you believe that the government, the federal government, that there is some type of a balance of our privacy and the safety of America? Uh, I sure do, Tony. The president said it yesterday that we can't have 100 percent security and 100 percent privacy at the same time. So I think that, you know, that's the if, if you go back and read uh, your Locke or your Hobbes, Tony, and you read about the social contract, that is w the contract that we enter into with the government, that we're willing to give up some of our freedom and our liberty in exchange for protection. It's up to us, of course, to let the government know <laughs> uh, when that's gone too far. Uh, I personally, from everything I've read this week, Tony, though, I, I in the case of the the monitoring of what, whether it's even phone calls in their entirety or just metadata, I don't think that the government has gone too far. My biggest critique would be I wish that they were more efficient with the data that they're collecting. Jake, what, what do you think? Yeah, I disagree with Sam on that. Uh, just when you look at the rules uh, of this country, it's uh, 
we, we we have to have federal legislators that follow the Constitution. That's the rule of law in this country. And the Fourth Amendment protects your privacy. It lets, allows people to be safe and secure in their persons and effects in their paper. And so this is a big infringement on that protected right in the Constitution. So if we were to agree with what Sam was to say, which I, I, I'll grant, granted, you know, I think maybe a lot of uh, people in the United States would tend to agree with what you said and what Sam said, but let's do it the right way and amend the Constitution. Uh, I would obviously be very opposed to that, but that's at least following the rule of law. But until you do that, people have the right to privacy, and if they are going to lose that right to privacy, it needs to come from a uh, warrant issued by a judge. Sam? Okay, so uh, I, I like a lot of what Jake said, but how about this, Tony? If I am having conversations <laughs> repeatedly with uh, some sort of Al-Qaeda affiliate or the affiliate of an Al-Qaeda affiliate, who does that record belong to? If it, wh whose property is that record if I'm having a cell phone conversation or a series of text messages or emails or whatever it may be with an international party that's not a U.S. citizen. Where do we, I, I think that's a difficult line to, to define. Okay, I, I can understand that example, and I've heard examples similar to that in the gun debate. One guy uses a gun in a bad way, so let's get rid of all people's gun. Well, one person is going to use a medium like uh, email or phone conversation in a bad way, and so let's monitor everyone's privacy or invade everyone's privacy. So I just don't buy into that premise. I think that's more of a collectivist viewpoint. I'm an individualist. I believe an individual should be empowered with their liberty, meaning they should have that right to privacy. Well, we're going to, uh, we're coming to the end of our show here almost, but I want to kind of end on a, a humorous note because the IRS made news again. Uh, some embarrassing videos popped up that, uh, and we're going to show this one. It's an appalling IRS Star Trek parody that head honchos in the IRS actually uh, paid for with, with our money, uh, with taxpayer money. And this is humorous, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> this video, the video is, if you actually, there if you, you just watch it for what it is, but, but realize that it isn't that humorous because uh, the IRS actually spent $60,000 in production of this video. I mean, Tony, here, we're not going to watch the whole thing, are we? No, we're not. But, <laughs> okay. you know, as, as uh, you know, purely uh, volunteer community activists here at the SCC Television Studios in White Bear Lake, not spending a dollar on our production, you know, to see the IRS waste, let's be honest, waste $60,000 on this video, it actually does make me mad. Yeah. Because they sent me a letter, I told you this not too long ago, saying that I owe them 500 oh, right. bucks from 2010 for... Who knows what? I'm still trying to figure that out. I don't think I owe it to them, but, you know, if they say I do and do my research, I'll figure it out. But that being said, you know, when they go in and waste uh, uh, money on this stuff, it's just absolutely uh, it's sad and pathetic, I, I believe. So we're going to watch some of this uh, right now. Formed. Captain, there may be another solution. I took the liberty of doing a time warp scan of the galaxy and believe I have found a gathering of leaders who could be of assistance. They met back in the 21st century in Anaheim, California. Earth, sir. That's perfect, Chris. We can go back in time and bring the leaders into our century and pick up some tax gap vaccine at a local pharmacy. Think, the travel expenses and medicine can be itemized. That's an idea, Bones. You too, Fink. In fact, I'm grateful for everyone's contribution to this problem. An engaged team is a successful team. Hmm, someone write that down. Can make a good weekly message. Well, hurry up. Tell Scotty and Engineering to get us back to Earth as fast as they can. Everybody, grab your strategic plans and get ready to beam down. Shall I wear a ski cap to cover my ears, Captain? All right, so that's that. these guys, like I said, are head honchos at the IRS. Spock, actually, uh, you know, this came out, and he had to go in front of Congress uh, to actually testify about this. And I'm going to look it up. The Wall Street Journal has it here. Uh, uh, it was published on June 6, 2013. So this is very recently that uh, Spock, uh, who is actually um, uh, Farius Fink, yep, he's a commissioner of the IRS's Small Business and Self-Employed Division. He was the one who was playing Spock. And so here's uh, Spock, Mr. Fink, testifying about this embarrassing video that came out. So we'll, uh, we'll play that right now. 
Mr. Chairman, um, those videos were, at that time they were made, were an attempt to, uh, in a well-intentioned way, use humor, the Star Trek video, to open the conference. Um, the dance video was uh, used to close the conference. Um, they would not occur today, uh, based upon all the, the guidelines that exist, and frankly, um, they were not appropriate at that time either, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. And uh, the fact of the matter is, is uh, it's embarrassing, and um, I apologize. Those videos, uh, I, I know in the Inspector General's report, there is not a clear delineation of the cost of, of both the videos, but uh, they are embarrassing, and, and, and I regret the fact that they were made. All right, so let's let's give credit where it's due. I mean, that seemed like a pretty heartfelt apology on on Spock or Mr. Fink's uh, uh, perspective. Yeah. So you know, I'll accept his apology, but I still can't get over the fact that it costs it sixty thousand dollars to make that video. Yeah. Hey, Tony. I've got a oh well, I got a I got an interesting perspective on it. Now, the cost, I might agree with you. I don't know how they justify sixty thousand if it was on wardrobe or what, but. Um, I mean, those videos, I saw those in the military, you know, goofy spoofs. Remember that linebacker that tackled people in the audio, uh, office? I remember seeing one of those for operational security in the military, so I'm sure they had an operating budget. I think the real problem is it just, the military is a necessity to our federal government. We need a military for protection of our liberty and our security here at home. The problem is this is the IRS which a lot of people don't really think is a legitimate organization because we don't think we should be paying income taxes directly to the United, to the federal government, let alone look at what happened in this scandal, and now they're using this money that way. Mm -hmm. Sam, you were going to say something? Uh, quick thought. The, so the, the $60,000 example for funding uh, the ridiculous video, uh, that's a good micro example, but uh, even even bigger picture... Uh, from 2010 to 12, over, over a two-year period, Tony, if you, if you read up on this, they spent $49 million on a series of conferences to do things like play the Spock video and, uh, le and learn to line dance as a team-building effort. So if you dig in a little more, the complete lack of oversight and, and their ability to spend money, that kind of, you know, those kind of dollars, it's uh, it, it's absolutely outrageous, and I want to, while we're on the air, uh, let people know. I think Jake and I both retweeted it this week that Senator Ted Cruz uh, is pushing a an abolish the IRS petition. Uh, everyone, please go sign it. Yeah, and once again, like I was talking about with the military, I mean that budget might not seem that crazy. A lot of people opining on that might not know what it really would cost to reserve a convention center and do what they need to do. The, the problem here is not so much just the, the cost or that the way they went about training. It's the fact that this is for an organization that really, you know, isn't constitutional, is, uh, a, a, is collecting wealth and taking wealth out of the private sector and bringing it to the federal coffers. And uh, we've known some abuses recently in that organization that have been targeting conservative groups. So that's where the real issue is. You know, and I think this is a, a good eye opener for, for many Americans to see, you know, what is exactly going on uh, with our government when we're facing record yeah, deficits, that's a, good point too. Well, a skyrocketing national debt and, and, all the, and, a, and still a fledgling economy that to see this money spent this way, it makes me think we either need a flat tax or even better, the fair tax, which is just a national sales tax system, and I don't believe we need the IRS. Yeah, well, or we go back to what we should have had and what's constitutional, that the income tax is laid onto or, or given or laid onto the states. It's not it's not collected directly on the people. It's instead collected by the states. Well, that's, uh, that's about all our time here on the Tony Hernandez Show. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Uh, we broadcast live every Saturday from 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock out of White Bear Lake at SCC Television Studios. We also rebroadcast on SPNN. You can find our YouTube channel at Tony Hernandez Show. May God bless you. May God bless America. And via con Dios. <laughs>